The Lives of the Saints by Father Alban Butler, November 18th, St. Rose, Philippine, Duchenne. On May 25th, we spoke about St. Madeline Sophie Barat and the founding of the Society of the Sacred Heart. In the course of our article, we made several allusions to Mother Duchenne, who introduced the congregation in the United States and was beatified in 1940. She was born in 1760 in Grenoble in the Dauphinate. Her father was a prosperous merchant. The child received at baptism the names of Rose Philippine. The first name was almost a prophecy because St. Rose of Lima, on the eve of whose feast the Blessed was born, was the first canonized saint of the New World. Rosa Filipina's childhood was nothing special. She was a child of strong and imperative character, inherited from her father's family, very serious and very fond of history. When Cosa was eight years old, a Jesuit who had been a missionary in the Lumisiana told the family many stories of Indians, which awakened in the girl an interest in the missions. Rosa Filipina attended the school of the Sisters of the Visitation of St. Marie Dan Ho. In addition, along with her cousins, the Perrier, she had a private tutor, so that she became an extraordinarily cultured woman. At the age of 17, when her parents were beginning to think of marrying her off, the young woman announced her resolution to enter the convent. At first, her project met with some opposition, but finally she was allowed to enter the convent of the Visitandines. However, a year and a half later, her father prevented her from making profession, not without reason, for the religious future in France seemed very dark to him. Indeed, in 1791, the Visitandines of Grenoble were expelled. Philippine then returned to the house of her family, who lived at that time in the countryside. During the years of the revolution, Philippine did everything possible to live as a religious. She looked after her family, assisted the sick, helped the confessors of the faith and the prisoners, and, above all, saw to the education of the children. When the Holy See signed the Concordat with Napoleon in 1801, Philippine was able to buy the buildings of the former convent of St. Marie Dan Ho. The Blessed had thought of re-establishing the community of Visitandines of which she had been a part, but the task proved not only more difficult than she had imagined, but simply impossible. Thus, on August 21st, 1802, the Feast of St. Jean, Françoise de Chantal, foundress of the Visitandines, it was decided that the enterprise would be abandoned. A few days later, Rosa Filipina and another nun were left alone in the convent. Naturally, there were those who said that this was further proof of the violence of the Duchenne's character and that Philippine had made life impossible for the other nuns. The Blessed then decided to offer the house to Mother Barra, who shortly before had founded in Amiens the first house of the Society of the Sacred Heart. The foundress accepted the proposal and on December 31, 1804, Philippine and four other postulants were admitted to St. Marie. St. Madeline Sophie Barat was Philippine's novice mistress. Such was the first contact of these two souls, one of marble and the other of bronze. Filipina made her profession less than a year later. The months of novitiate served to bring the foundress and the aspirant closely together and helped Filipina to better understand religious discipline, for until then she had been too much in her own way. Perhaps Philippine's greatest trial was to renounce her personal penances and mortifications at the order of her superior. At the beginning of 1806, the abbot of La Trappe, Dom Augustin de Lestrange, who three years earlier had sent the first Cistercian monks to the United States, came to visit the convent of St. Marie. That visit inflamed Philippine's desire to leave for the North American mission. Today, the United States is no longer considered a mission territory, but 140 years ago, there were still no European settlers in many regions. The frontier of civilization was advancing very slowly westward, and Indians constituted a significant part of the population. Although Mother Barat did not oppose the plan, 12 years were to elapse before Mother Duchesne could carry it out. During those 12 years, God's chosen instrument was to be perfected, both spiritually and in external administration. Finally, the time set by God arrived. Bishop Dubourg, Bishop of Louisiana, asked Mother Barat to send him some religious as soon as possible. The saint promised to do so, but perhaps she would have postponed the project indefinitely if Mother Duchesne had not intervened directly and with great energy. Thus, in March 1818, five religious of the Sacred Heart left Bordeaux for the New World. Mother Duchesne, against her will, had been appointed superior of the expedition. 
After a very arduous voyage, Philippine wrote, Seasickness is a horrible thing that affects the head and the stomach and makes any occupation impossible. The expedition landed in New Orleans on May 29th, the Feast of the Sacred Heart. The nuns sailed up the Mississippi to St. Louis, then a town of 6,000 inhabitants in what is now the state of Missouri. There they were met by Bishop Dubourg, who gave them a log cabin at St. Charles, where they opened the first free school for poor children west of the Mississippi. The white population, composed of French, Creoles, English, etc., was mostly Catholic. Many of the inhabitants were bilinges. The nuns had begun to study English as soon as they learned that they were destined for the United States, but Blessed Philippine never became proficient in the language. Two casual reflections of hers shed light on the people with whom the religious worked. Some of our disciples have more jackets than shirts and handkerchiefs. At Portage de Sioux, the walls of the church were adorned with images of Bacchus and Venus out of sheer ignorance. Concerning the Indians, the Blessed wrote, We had been under the pleasant illusion that we were going to teach docile and innocent savages, but the women are as lazy and drink as much as the men. After a harsh winter, the bishop decided that the community should move to Florissant, closer to St. Louis. There the nuns settled two days before Christmas, 1819. Mother Duchesne wrote a vivid account of the acute rigors of the weather during the journey, compounded by the complication of the escape of a cow. The new residence, which was more comfortable, lent itself to the opening of a novitiate, but Bishop Dubourg was not much inclined to it, considering the character of the Yankees as too independent. However, the way opened of its own accord, for a postulant who wanted to become a lay sister came forward spontaneously to ask for admission. On November 22, 1820, Mary Layton took the habit of the religious of the Sacred Heart and became the first American religious of the congregation. With the opening of the novitiate and the progress of the school, the horizon began to open. On the other hand, Blessed Philippine understood better and better the strange inhabitants of that foreign country. We must not forget that the Blessed was about to turn 50 when she crossed the Atlantic and that she was French to the bone. These people puzzled her as much by their vices as by their virtues. And it has been said, not without reason, that Mother Duchesne probably never possessed extraordinary tact in her dealings with non-Europeans. Be that as it may, the Blessed became gentler with age, as often happens, but without losing any of her former enthusiasm. Indeed, in 1821, she wrote to Mother Barat, I thought that all my ambitions were already satisfied, but I am inflamed with the desire to go to Peru. But nevertheless, I have become more reasonable than when I was in France, and I used to bother you continually with my vain desires. That same year, the second house of the congregation was inaugurated in Grand Coteau, some 225 kilometers from New Orleans. Mother Duchesne decided to visit this foundation, and the trip was probably the hardest of all the ones she made. In fact, the outward journey took four weeks and the return trip took nine weeks. On the return trip, a yellow fever epidemic broke out on the ship and the mother witnessed the inhuman attitude of the healthy who abandoned the sick for fear of contagion. Blessed Philippine took care of a sick person whom she baptized before dying and that almost cost her her life for she contracted the disease and was disembarked at Natchez where she could find no other refuge than the bed of a sick woman who had just died of yellow fever. When she returned to Florissant, trials began to follow. Material difficulties, envy, and the calumnies of strangers were about to ruin the school. The Blessed wrote to Mother Barat, The only thing they have not said about us is that we poison the children. Finally, when there were only five disciples left, the horizon began to clear. One of the main causes of the difficulties had been the departure of Bishop Dubourg for southern Louisiana. But in 1823, the bishop succeeded in getting the Jesuits to transfer the novitiate from Maryland to Florissant. It is difficult to determine whether, in the years that followed, the nuns owed more to the Jesuits or the Jesuits owed more to the nuns. In 1826 and 1827, two new houses were opened, St. Michael near New Orleans and St. Louis, Missouri. And in 1828, the St. Charles Foundation was reopened. Counting the house at Bayou La Fourche, the religious of the Sacred Heart now had six communities in the Mississippi Valley. In the following ten years, the Blessed had no shortage of trials. Difficulties, disappointments, and illnesses were frequent. Finally, in 1840, 
Mother Duchenne succeeded in having herself relieved of her duties, although it was not Mother Barat who granted her this grace. In fact, the Assistant General of the Society of the Sacred Heart went to visit the foundations in the United States. She was Mother Elizabeth Galitzin, who, with her strong and imperious character, similar to that of Mother Duchesne in her youth, provoked a rather violent reaction among the religious in the United States. Blessed Philippine did not put up any resistance to the autocratic methods of the visitatrix, who was 28 years younger than herself, but, thinking that she had not been equal to the mission entrusted to her, she asked her to relieve her of the superiorate. Mother Galitzin agreed to the point, and Mother Duchenne returned to the house of St. Louis as one of many sisters. Thus, at the age of 71, she was finally able to consecrate her devotion to the Indians, for whom she had gone to work in the New World. The famous Jesuit, Dismet, had asked Mother Galitzin to send some nuns to found a school at Sugar Creek, Kansas, to instruct the Potawatomi. One of the four nuns designated for the mission was Mother Duchenne, if she could make the trip. She was able to do so, but spent only one year among her beloved Indians because she could not learn their language, and the hard life was too much for her weak strength. Mother Duchesne would have liked to stay and convert the Rocky Mountain Indians to Christ, but her superiors sent her back. The Blessed simply said, God knows why I am being removed from here, and that's even. Mother Duchesne spent her last years at St. Charles. They were not easy years. The progress of the Society of the Sacred Heart in the United States was not without its vicissitudes. Many of the houses that Mother Duchesne had founded seemed destined to disappear. Moreover, for two years, all correspondence between Blessed Philippine and Mother Barat was mysteriously lost. Thus, Mother Duchenne, who died on November 18, 1852, ended her life of apostolate and self-denial in suffering and prayer. One of her contemporaries wrote, She was the St. Francis of Assisi of our congregation. Over her and everything about her was the sign of the cross. Mother Duchesne would have liked to disappear completely in the eyes of men, and it can be said that no one occupied a lesser place in the world than she did. Her chamber was a miserable cave. In the only window, several broken panes of glass had been replaced by paper. Her bed consisted of a mattress two inches thick, which she spread on the floor at night and kept in a closet during the day. Her only coverlet was an old black cloth with a cross on it, like a burial sheet. After her death, a daguerreotype was taken of her, just in case she might one day be canonized. Less than a century after her death, the day of her canonization does not seem far off. As she was beatified in 1940, the feast of this French missionary saint of the United States is celebrated on November 17th.